Hello, people of God. Thank you again for joining us tonight on our online Bible study. Uh, we want to give a shout out to everyone who is joining us for the first time. Thank you so much for joining us. And we want to trust that you've had a blessed and a fruitful week. Now, over the last weeks, I'm sure many of you have watched the unrest that's been taking place in our world, the chaos and the despair, the discouragement and the anger over the killings of uh, some black people in America. And it's appropriate to be angry when we see the kind of levels of callousness that we've seen over the last few weeks. We've seen no human empathy. We've seen systematic injustices. But if we're not careful, we can internalize the chaos that's all around us, the despair and the anger, and let it get to us. And of course, the result is often that we are robbed of joy and we are robbed of the peace of God that we ought to have on the inside of us. And that's why I want to read a scripture for you very quickly today before we take some time to worship God. And that scripture is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And this is what it says. It says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I want you to notice it says, these are the things I want you to meditate on. I don't want you to meditate on the horrible things that are happening all around you. I don't want you to uh, meditate on the things that are causing despair and discouragement. I want you to meditate on things that are true, things that are noble, things that are just, things that are pure, and things that are lovely. In other words, what the apostle is telling us here is that what you focus your mind on is what feeds your soul. What you focus your mind on is what feeds your soul. It feeds your spirit. It nurtures you on the inside. So let us refocus today on the word of God. Let's refocus today on the things that are noble, the things that are true, the things that are pure, the things that are just and the things that are lovely. And the Bible says if we do that, then verse 7 of that scripture says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, the peace of God will cause us to be joyful and to be secure and to be empowered to continue to live for Christ here on earth. So let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Lord, even as we go into his word today, to speak to us and to cause our minds to be shifted from the negative things that are happening all around us to the things of God. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you today for your kindness and your goodness towards us. Precious Father, we want to say we're grateful for everything that you're doing in our lives. We know there is chaos outside. We know there are challenges in our world. But we ask you today to help us to refocus our mind on your word. We ask that you will speak to us today. We ask that you will instruct us. And we ask that you will open our eyes to your truth today that will cause us to walk in ways that are pleasing to you. We give you thanks and praise for hearing our prayers today as we worship you. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Well, why don't you join us in our praise and worship now. God bless you.
Church, I'm glad that you're able to make it with us this evening to tonight's Bible study. My topic this evening is the joy of being used by God. The joy of being used by God in evangelism. That is the topic this evening. The joy of being used by God in evangelism. The text I have this uh, evening, the first text will be from Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 and then verses 7 to 8. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 and then verses 7 and 8. And it says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. And then verse 7 says, As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received and freely give. The second scripture I would like to read will be from the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8. Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8. And it reads, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this evening we come to present ourselves to you once again. We thank you for that little song that you have dropped upon uh, my heart since yesterday that says, what shall we say or what shall we do? All that we need to do is to offer our hearts totally and completely to you. And we know that when we do that, you can indeed use us because you are looking for yielded and willing vessels. Tonight, as we go into the study of your word, 
I pray that the realities of your word will dawn upon our hearts in the name of Jesus. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you will touch each and every one of us and help us to see where we are in you and help us to see what we can accomplish when we choose to partner with you. Father, thank you. Minister to us. Let nobody's life be the same way after today's sharing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I would like to read an introduction. Evangelism is the art of preaching the gospel with the aim of getting or winning converts. So just a little definition. My definition of evangelism is the art of preaching the gospel with an aim in mind. Not just to preach and say things and just preach and just, you know, put the word out there. But you have an aim, you have an objective. The aim is getting or winning converts to Christ by getting them born again, thereby making them candidates for heaven. So there's a, there a number of things in here. It's the winning of the converts to Christ by getting them born again. Not just a little decision, okay, yes, I think I'm a sinner and all that, okay, I think I'll come to church and join your church. No, beyond that, but getting them to recognize that they are a sinner and they need Christ and Christ came to die for them and explaining it very clearly to them the A's and B's and C's of what Christ came to accomplish so that everybody who hears it can appreciate it. They can see their, their, their spiritual state that they're in such a mess and it's only Christ that can fix that mess and make them worthy of heaven. Hallelujah. And so it's the, it's the getting them to Christ by getting them born again, thereby making them candidates for heaven. So you can see there's a, a progression. It's not just evangelism, just preaching. They just preach. Oh, I went out to preach. I went out to do evangelism. And hey, I preached to 10 people. But the ability to actually bring them into the body of Christ by making them make that commitment to Christ in prayer, accepting him as their Lord and Savior, and, and then making them candidates for heaven. It's akin to when a, a, a fisherman goes to the ocean or to the river to catch fish and he throws his net and what happens when he throws that net it goes all over the place and any fish or anything in that place crabs anything in that area when they pull it in what happens it, it gets caught in the net hallelujah and that is exactly what we do when we say we are doing evangelism. We are casting the net into the world and trusting that as we preach the word, people, will, the, the word, the anointing in the word will cause conviction in the hearts of the hearers. And when they hear the word and they get that conviction, they will come to the, Lord, the saving knowledge of, of Christ, give their hearts to the Lord, become born again and become candidates for heaven. Hallelujah. And that is the, 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 the summary a bit on there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So I have a question here. Why is evangelism so important? Why is evangelism so important? And I have a little answer here. It is the difference between eternal life and eternal judgment. The difference between eternal life and eternal condemnation. The difference between eternal life and eternal damnation. That is the reason why we need to preach. So when we say, why, do, why is it so important? Why do we have to preach? Once we recognize that this evangelism is what separates people from going to heaven or going to hell. In other words, that is the determining factor. Whether we preach or not, whether we preach or not, it is the determining factor. So that will now make us to really want to reach out to the unbelievers and preach to them and share the gospel with them. Not just so we can say, oh, I preach to somebody, but we have an objective in mind that we want to get them born again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It is the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation. Now, God drew a line in the sand when he said that he, uh, he that does not believe is condemned already. In the book of John chapter 3, verse 18, he said that he that does not believe is condemned already. God drew a line in the sand. Now, this is God speaking. 
So we, we need to uh, understand something about God. God does not compromise when it comes to certain things. And he drew the line very clearly in the sand, saying, anybody who is not born again, who does not believe, will be condemned. That means they are condemned to an eternal hellfire. No mincing words. So that that helps us to, when we see someone, when you have this at the back of your mind, every time you see someone, you are thinking, is this one a candidate for heaven? Is this one going to heaven? Or right now, is he going to hell or she going to hell? And that in a way will help you, motivate you, because of the compassion you have in your heart would make you to want to now reach out to this person and share the gospel with them. In some cases, you may just share the word as in sowing a seed, a seed of the word. And in some cases, as you make that step to begin to speak, the Spirit of God begins to put words in your mouth so that as you are preaching or speaking to that person, you know if it is time for you to reel in this fish. So when you go home to the river to catch a fish and you cast your net or you cast your hook, and the hook has caught a fish. You don't just, you know, hold the thing there and let the fish be dangling and dangling and eventually set yourself, you know, set yourself free and run back into the water. What do you do? You catch that, you reel that thing in. Hallelujah. And now you've got a fish, probably a fish for dinner, as it were. But this fish we're talking about is not the fish you are going to eat. Because the Bible says, I will make you fishers of men. Hallelujah. So we're actually going out there to catch fish, the souls of men. And as we preach the gospel to them, what happens? They hear the gospel. The Spirit of God brings conviction in their spirit. And when they receive that conviction, they are ready to be reeled in. Hallelujah. So we don't preach them, preach to them and get them to the point of conviction and then leave them and let them go back. No, we don't do that. We actually reel them in by now saying the sinner's prayer with them and, and ensuring that now they are born again. We take their details and then we try to impose them to a church, a Bible-believing church, stuff like that. If they're in the area near your church, you invite them to your church. If they're not in your area and they live somewhere else and you can impose them to another ministry or church, so be it. But at the end of the day, the idea is to cast the net out, cast the hook out and reel the fish in. Hallelujah. It's not just enough to go out there to preach and speak, but it's enough to actually bring them in, reel them in, into the body of Christ, into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So God drew the line when he said it, that he that does not believe is condemned already. And also Jesus said again, that he who does not believe is condemned. In the book of Mark chapter 16 verse 16, he that does not believe is condemned already, is condemned. Hallelujah. So Jesus drew the, the line. J Jesus helped us to see that this is a very, very serious matter. Fine, he's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a wonderful Lord, sweet Father, loving Father, caring Father, compassionate. And we know all of that. But there's a line that God will not pass. And that is, he's drawn the line in the sand and said, for you to come to me, you must be born again. For you to come to heaven, you must be born again. And he has given us that commission and said we should go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. So when we do these things, what happens? We are indirectly bringing joy to God and also we are feeling that joy as well because we feel that we are being used by God to accomplish what is on his heart. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So Psalm chapter uh, 2 and verse 8, as we read earlier, says, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Ask me. Now, many of us are used to asking God. Matthew 7, 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. Whoever knocks, the door will be open. And whoever uh, asks, we will receive, you know, and so on and so on. We're all very happy and we quote those scriptures when we pray. Father, you said in your word, if I, if I ask of you, I shall receive. And we are very, very, very passionate when we pray about that. But many people don't realize that also in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8, God asks us to ask him for the nations. He asks us to ask him for unbelievers and he will give them to us. Why is that? That's very deep. We don't have the time to, at this moment, to ex uh, 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 ex expound on this particular verse. Yes, we don't at this time. But I'll do my best to just explain one or two things and then move on because we have a lot to cover tonight. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. 
Hallelujah. I will give you the nations for your inheritance. That means that as we go, as we ask of him for souls, so we're coming to a place and we see the place where people are sinful, people are dying, people are doing horrible things. We can actually pray and ask God for the life of somebody and say, God, have mercy on this person. Lord, let this person get born again. Do a work in their life. When I go to preach to them, may they hear the word. May they receive the gospel in the name of Jesus. And many times before we go out to do evangelism, we pray. Uh, last year when we had the turning in the church, in the King's House Church, remember we, we actually spent some time worshiping and praising God. Then we spent time actually praying and interceding for the people that we were going to preach to. And of course, we went out there and we came back with testimonies of many people that made decisions for Christ. And that is how you do it. You intercede and pray that God will lead you. God will guide your steps. God will order your steps so that he will lead you to the person who is ready to receive right now. Hallelujah. There's a place in the book of Acts where Jesus was speaking and he told, I think it was Paul, that I have much people in this city. In other words, don't hold your peace because I have lots of people in this city. Hallelujah. So God knows those who are going to give their lives to him in a particular city, in a particular nation, in a particular area. And if, you, if we yield ourselves as servants in his hand, what happens? He uses us and he leads us. He guides us. He directs us to particular people who he wants us to minister the gospel to. Hallelujah. And many times when we do that, we get the instant results. They give their, give their life to Christ, born again, accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, now becoming permanent candidates for heaven. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, heaven rejoices over a single sinner who does what? Who repents. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'd like us to look at John chapter 15 and verse 16. John chapter 15 and verse 16. John 15 and verse 16. It says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Hallelujah. Most times when we quote this scripture, we are talking in terms of the fruit of the Spirit. And I, I don't really think that this scripture is talking about the fruit of the Spirit here, in this place here, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's talking about actually preaching and stuff like that. He says, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you. I chose you and I appointed you. The King James Version says, I ordained you. I ordained you. I appointed you. I have anointed you. I have given you an ability. And if you remember where we read earlier in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, he says that he ordained them, he gave them an anointing. An ordination means that there's an impartation. There's an impartation of power and anointing for purpose. Not to bear spiritual fruits of the the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance. The Bible says above such there is no law. That is different because a tree will bear fruit. You don't, you, you, you don't prime a tree and prophesy to a tree to bear fruit. A tree will bear fruit as far as it's planted and it's got nutrients, it's got water, it's got air, it's got rain and sun. It will bear fruit. So it doesn't need an anointing, a special prompting and all that. But for us to be effective as ministers of God, we need the anointing, we need the ordination, we need the call of God, we need the hand of God upon us because we are going into Satan's territory to get people out, to get people saved, to get people away from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so people need that power of God to be able to see their spiritual state, their lost spiritual state, for them to be able to cross over and give their life to Christ. And so when Jesus is speaking here in the book of John chapter 15, verse 16, he says, I did not choose you, sorry, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, appointed you. So he's, he's, he's not talking about bearing spiritual fruits or spiritual, you know, spiritual fruits, like stuff like that. He's saying something that you should go and bear fruits. I'm asking you to go and bear fruit. In other words, now that you, you are saved, now just bring it to our own current day. Now that you are saved, what, what fruit are you bearing? When you stand before God on that day, what are you going to bring before God? Are you going to say, Lord, I walked in, I walked, uh, I, I, I walked in love, uh, love, I, walked, I had joy, peace, long-suffering. Those are not fruits. Those are not the fruit that we're talking about here. When you stand before God, God expects you to walk in the spirit. God expects you to to walk in love. God expects you to have all the the fruit of the spirit as detailed in the book of uh, uh, Galatians. 
He expects you to do that. So that is not what he's equipping you for. He's equipping you for ministry. Each and every one of us, God is equipping us for ministry. And this ministry, some people say, well, you know, I'm not called into the office of evangelist. I'm just a little helper here. I'm a little, you know, I just do my little bit in the church. Or I just do my little bit in, the, in my own corner here. I just worship and praise him and, and just wait for the rapture. Beyond that, God expects us to do much more than that. So when he gave that commission to the church, it's not just one that is optional. So when, for example, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, it wasn't a suggestion. Go into all the world and preach the gospel is not a suggestion, one. Number two, it's not optional. It's not so we don't come to a place where we see the word of God and we pick and choose what we feel applies to us. So, uh, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Jesus. Yeah, I claim that one. I take that one. But then when he says, go into all the world and preach, we say, ah, that one, we leave it for the evangelism team in the church. You understand? When, when it comes to other things of ministry, of, of work that produces powerful uh, results in the realm of the spirit, we should be careful not to pick and choose and relegate some of those things away from us and, as it were, choose certain things that we feel we like that will help us me, how I'm going to be blessed and be protected and be guided. Me, me, me and my family. It's like some people come to church, like somebody said, they come to church with a shovel. And when the preaching is going on, as soon as they hear something that, oops, I don't like this one, they use a the shovel and push it, shovel it back, maybe to the next person behind them. Or, you know, whoosh, you know, go into other one that preach the gospel, take it, shovel it away. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings, heavenly places. Yeah, I receive that in Jesus' name. And you see, when we pick and choose like that, it shows that we are not spiritually mature. It shows that we have not come to a space, a space or place of spiritual maturity where we begin to take our place in the body because Christ saved us for a purpose, not just to enjoy the ride all the way to heaven. Hallelujah, oh, there's occasional bombs on the way, but in the sweet by and by, we will get to heaven. Beyond all of that, but that we should be ministers in his house. The Bible says that everyone is an able minister in the book of Corinthians. Everyone is an able minister, hallelujah. And you and I are able ministers in that respect, praise the Lord. So in that same scripture, when he says, I ordained you that you should go, the word go there means to go and preach. Then the second part of that, to bear fruit, also means that you get people saved, you pray with them, and get them converted, get them saved. In other words, when you go, he says, go and bring forth. Go and bring forth. So if I say to you, go and bring something from your car or from my car, you know that you're actually physically moving from here to go out there to grab something and bring it. So it's something tangible that you will have to bring to present back to me. So when he says, I'm sending you to go and bring forth, it means I'm sending you to go there do something and come back with the fruits, the evidence of what I have given you, I've asked you to do, I've anointed you to do, I've ordained you to do, I have equipped you to do. And God has equipped each and every one of us, you and I, to preach this gospel. It's not the uh, uh, exclusive reserve for pastors or evangelists or particular big ancients of days Christians who have been in the body of Christ for years. No, it's the exclusive right of everybody, every one of us born again. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then, so the third bit there says that, so first one he says, I've ordained you, you should go, number one. Number two, bear fruit. Number three, that your fruit should remain. Hallelujah. What does that fruit remaining mean? It means that you should disciple them. That is powerful. That is powerful. And even me, I'm getting this revelation, I'm saying, God, help me. I, I go out there, I preach, I share, people get saved. But I, I, I've struggled with that area of discipline. And I'm, I'm thanking the Lord that he's equipping me and he's enabling me to be able to disciple those whom I actually lead to the Lord. And that's my prayer. That's where I am spiritually with God right now. Where are you? So you would need to assess where you are so that you can actually be able to do what God has called you to do because he has anointed each and every one of us for this purpose. Hallelujah. And I'm praying that tonight, as you hear this, as it resonates in your spirit, you will not let it just pass away, but that you would embrace it and ask God for his grace, his ability, his anointing, his direction 
to help you order your steps and guide you to begin to fulfill the steps of a, of a, of a thousand journey starts with one, a, a, a thousand miles start with one step. Hallelujah. For you to take, for you to move a thousand miles, you have to start with one step. And as you do that, what happens? God enables you and God begins to expand all your course. God begins to minister to you. And then there's a little promise there that Jesus attaches to that commandment there. He says that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, because you are pleasing God so much, you, are, you have partnered with God. The scriptures are to this, to this effect. The Bible says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works or for good works. We are his workmanship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are working together with him, partnering together with him to bring all of this to pass. And what happens? Because we are partners with him, he will make sure that whatever you ask of him, he will grant it. People are praying for anointing. God, give me anointing. Oh, I want the gifts of the spirit. I want revelation gifts, prophecy, visions, you know, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, design of spirits, faith to move mountains, gifts of healings. I want all these gifts and all that gift. What are you going to do with it when God gives you? Is it so you can, you know, right, I've got, I've got the gifts. And you just sit down hardly doing anything with it? No. But the gifts are for service. And so if God has used you in the past, maybe this is a word for you as well. Maybe, you know, things with the lockdown, a lot of things have happened, things have slowed down. Yes, we all understand. But I believe that during this time is a time to really build ourselves up in him. Build ourselves up. So when the lockdown is over, and it's going to be over very, very soon, we can begin to actually do the work of the ministry. Another thing I want to quickly say here, there have been prophecies in the past that the time may come when the open doors for the gospel will begin to shut slowly and, and slowly. And we can even see it with this lockdown. Where were the first places they were mentioning when they were talking about lockdown? Churches. No more baptisms, according to the Prime Minister. No more baptisms and stuff like that. No more gatherings. But that is where the power of God is. No, you know, they shut the doors of the church and stuff like that. And so it has worked in this first one under the guise of this, you know, this coronavirus. Under, you know, because of the coronavirus, doors have been shut. Now what happens next? The devil wants to bring some nonsense. So when the doors open again, this is the time for us to go back and begin to share the gospel and preach and minister and really, really put our feet to the ground and get up and do stuff for God. So that heaven will rejoice. We are rejoicing and great many things happen. Why? Because we have partnered, we are partnering with God to bring souls to the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So who is evangelism for? Evangelism is for everyone. Evangelism is for everyone. Hallelujah. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Hallelujah. Do the work of an evangelist. That's what he's talking about here. But who, he was telling Timothy this. But who was Timothy? Timothy was a pastor. He was a pastor in charge of a group of people. He was a pastor. But here, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, God is telling Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. In other words, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you don't preach. You don't evangelize. That's the word. So let us dissociate our minds away from compartmentalizing all the ministries okay sure we know that you know god anoints you and calls you into ministries yes but the area of evangelism is for everybody really now everybody can't be a pastor necessarily everybody can't be a prophet necessarily but what everybody can possibly be and i use the word possibly be is an evangelist why because christ already said go into all the world and preach and he didn't dif differentiate or distinguish when he was saying it, he says, go into all and preach. And if you decide to get up and start preaching, God is not going to be upset with you. And say, ah, oh, stop, 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 stop. Please don't preach. I, I, I don't mean you should preach. He, I meant another person to preach, not you. No, he is happy. Why? Because you are bringing many souls to the feet of the Lord. Hallelujah. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says... Hallelujah. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men, some people count slackness, 
but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, God is not slack concerning his promise. He's going to come again. Things are going to happen. Read the book of Matthew chapter 24, chapter 25. Read the, read the end. See what happens there towards the end of the, of the ages. Hallelujah. But he says that he's not slack concerning his promises. But he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. In other words, you can see the magnanimity of God, the magnanimity of his heart, that God does not want anybody, the worst sinner in this world, he does not want them to go to hell. Hallelujah. He doesn't want them to perish, but that they should all come to repentance. That's the greatness of God, the greatness of God. So if the, God is still giving the time and the space for people to repent, but we don't engage with him, we don't engage with the Holy Spirit, we don't call upon him, we don't ask him to use us, even if it's one soul a day or one soul a week, and we all did one soul a week, ha, wow, that is great, that's wonderful, things will be happening, rejoicing in heaven, praise the Lord. You understand? So we trust in the Lord that as we read these things, it will help us to partner with God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I want to also quickly say this here about um, perishing. Uh, hell is real. And that is probably the biggest motivating factor for my preaching and sharing. And I believe it should also be for many people as well. Because uh, um, God, like I said at, at the beginning, God drew a line in the sand. That if you do not believe, if you don't accept him, if you're not born again, you're condemned already. The unbeliever is condemned already. In other words, they are already under a condemnation, which means the moment they die, hell express, going straight to hell. And so when you have that at the back of your mind, it doesn't matter whatever reason people use to give their life to Christ. People say, oh, well, don't preach fear. If you preach hell, to be them afraid and all that stuff. Whatever suits you, fine, preach it. You win converts however God would use you. Does that make sense? Whatever grace is on your heart, on your mind, how God will use you to win converts, as long as they come into the kingdom of God and they remain and they stay. And don't just feel remorseful for their sin and just say, I'm sorry, Lord, and then just join the church. But deep down, they have not 100% committed their hearts to the Lord. Now, there's something called Conviction. And there's a difference between conviction and when someone is not convicted. So when the conviction of God, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes upon somebody, they 100% turn their lives over to God. But how many people do we see in, in places? They go to church, they say they are born again. But you can't see any conviction in their lives. You can't see any conviction that they really fear God with the way they behave with the way they treat their spouses, the way they treat their husbands, the way they treat their wives, the way they behave towards colleagues, the way they talk outside. You can't really see any conviction that this person is converted. And this is what we're talking about. So it's not just church membership. That somebody, you just preach somebody, invite them to your church and then they start coming. And many of these ha things happen. But we're we are talking about evangelism, the pure evangelism, where people actually get convicted, get saved. They give their hearts to the Lord and they get born again. And we're not saying everybody who gets born again is 100% perfect. No, we're not saying that. But because you have been born again, when you miss it, you know you have missed it. And because you have missed it, you hate sin. Why? Because you hate to disappoint your God, your Father. And that makes you to run back to God. I used to say that the love of God will make people draw near to God. But the fear of God will make you run away from sin. And somebody who is genuinely born again will know the difference. Hallelujah. And we'll be able to embrace both of them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. A very, very popular scripture. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Hallelujah. Very, very popular scripture. We cannot talk about evangelism without looking at that particular scripture. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said to them, go. Hallelujah. Not a suggestion as we said earlier. It is a command, a command to each and every one of us. And I pray tonight that we will, we will stir ourselves up to take this and say, God, I want to do something about this. God, I want to partner with you to, 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 to fulfill this scripture, to preach. 
and not run away and not feel shy. Because God has not given you the spirit of shyness, but he has given unto you the spirit of boldness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah to every creature. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 22 and verses 9 to 10. Matthew chapter 22 verses 9 to 10. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Pastor Tony was sharing with us uh, last week on, you know, the, the wedding. This wedding had been prepared. All right, um, guests come. Oh, I've got a, I just bought a new ox. I just bought one ox, so I want to go and try them. I want to go and try it on my farm to see how strong the ox is, how, how well the ox. Because, you know, they use ox for, for um, breaking the ground when you want to do farming. In the good old days, they didn't have tractors. So when you buy a, a, an ox, that's what you use to break the ground so you can, till, you can use to till your ground. Oh, I just bought some ox, oxen, so I want to go and try it. On the wedding days, when you want to go and try it. Okay. Oh, what about you? Oh, I just got married. I want to go and try my wife. I mean, I want to, you know, I can't come. Nonsense. You have your wife all this time. You mean, come for it. You had a wedding. Everybody came to yours. Now I'm inviting you to mine and you're giving an excuse. What are you talking about? And so, they, they, of course, if you prepare the wedding feast, the wedding hall, you've hired hall, you've cooked, you have everything prepared, that's money. And if nobody comes, what happens? You can't store the, free, the food in a the fridge. They didn't have fridges in those days. What are you going to do? The man was, was, was beginning to tremble. All right, if you guys don't want to come, no problem. Hey, guys, go into all the world and bring people in. Bring them into this place. Just call, invite people in. Go to the highways. Tell them there's some free food somewhere there. There's a party. And of course, people love free party. People love free food. Now, that was an allegory or an analogy or a type of heaven. So all those people whom the Lord sent out to go and bring people to the wedding feast are the evangelists. Who are they? They are you and I. They are you and I. And he's telling us, God has prepared a banquet. He has prepared a wedding. Wow! What's going to happen if nobody comes? If we don't go and preach, that means... There are lots of tables and, and chairs and tables full of food, but not enough people to eat it. And that's why there is an urgency in the realm of the Spirit right now that God wants us to really, you know, get our act together, partner with Him, walk with Him, and begin to share the gospel, begin to evangelize. Hallelujah. You don't need a title to preach. You don't need a title to evangelize. Just do the work. Like Paul told Peter, like Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In order to appreciate why <clears throat> we must evangelize, we must understand why Jesus Christ came. So in order for us to appreciate evangelism, why we should evangelize, we need to appreciate the real reason why Christ came. Well, why did Christ come? Is it just to give us a new set of code of conduct to live by? A new set of creed, a new creed? Is it just to start a new religion? Is that why Christ came? Did he just come just to protect us and guide us and lead us home safely to heaven? Simply put, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. You and I were once lost, but now we are born again. And he's now ordaining us and asking us to go and do likewise. Just as somebody preached to you and you got born again, now it's time for you to go out and win souls as well. And beyond win winning souls, ensuring that in some way they are discipled. So if you can share some scriptures with them from time to time, fine. If not, bring them to church. Call them up from time to time and say, hey, how is your Christian faith? Are you reading your Bible? What have you read today? What have you gained? And so on and so forth. Praise the Lord. When we partner with God to see souls saved, we can never go unnoticed by God. And that's talking about the reward now. When we partner with God to see souls saved, souls saved, we can never, never go unnoticed by God. Souls is the biggest thing in God's heart. Souls is the closest things, the closest thing to God's heart. So when we win souls, we feel the approval of God because we are his, his man, we are his main man or main woman doing his bidding, doing his biggest will. 
His approval gives us joy. Hallelujah. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn men into righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those who turn others to righteousness. In other words, they were living in unrighteousness. They were unbelievers on their way to hell. But when you turn them from unrighteousness to righteousness, what happens? You will shine like the firmament forever. You will shine. That's your light is shining. Hallelujah. The Bible says you are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. A city set upon the hill cannot be hidden. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So the joy of pleasing God and putting a smile on God's face is, the, is joy enough for me. So the joy of evangelism is the fact that when I, when I preach and evangelize and people get saved, that is joy in God, with God. God is happy. And that is enough joy for me. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. We're talking about the reward here. Finally, there is laid for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my cause. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Or as this one says, on that day. Hallelujah. So there is a reward, folks, for serving God. There is a reward for serving for ministering to God, for serving in his house, for witnessing, for preaching, for bringing many souls to the feet of God. In conclusion, my prayer is that after hearing this sermon, this teaching, you know, what we've talked about today, that we will all make up our minds to be used by God in depopulating hell and populating heaven. Hallelujah. Thereby bringing joy in heaven and a smile on God's face. We just mentioned, quoted the other scripture that says that there is rejoicing in heaven over a single sinner. Every single, every sinner who gets saved. Praise the Lord. The joy of being used by God is the joy we all share with heaven as angels rejoice that we are partners with God and the Holy Spirit to bring souls to Christ. Hallelujah. And the last scripture there, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, which Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, which says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. A workman is a workman who does work. A workman who does not work. Can we call him a workman? I don't know about that. But it says that we are his workmanship, so we must all engage in this and prayerfully seek the face of the Lord to help us to take the first step, the very first step, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step and as we begin to do that God empowers us and enables us to do the work of an evangelist to preach to bring many souls to his feet let's pray heavenly father thank you for everything we've been able to share tonight the joy of bringing souls to you the joy of serving you in evangelism and we are thankful to you today, O oh God, for the things that we've shared and been able to bring before you today, before your people. And we ask in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you would let this word resound in our spirits. Father, in our waking moments, speak to us. Bring to our remembrance these things that we have heard. Let these things challenge us to get up, to arise, to be strong, to preach, to minister. To, to move out of our comfort zones and do things that will bring joy to you, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus that as many as raise up their hands and subscribe with the upstretched hand and says, Father, here am I, use me. I pray, O oh God, indeed you will use them. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. And God bless you. Thanks for listening.
Wow, I trust that you were blessed by that word, the joy of being used by God in evangelism, in reaching out to others with the good news and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and helping them become followers of Christ. I trust that that has inspired and encouraged you. And we know, as we've learned today, that we are partnering with God. We're also partnering with the Holy Spirit to bring people into the kingdom. What an awesome privilege to be partners with God in all of this. And I know there's so many joys you can have. You can have the joy of maybe buying your first house or passing your driving test or buying your first car. But the joy of leading somebody from an eternity away from God to an eternity with God is a joy that nothing can compare to. I had that privilege just a few weeks ago to lead somebody to the Lord in that way. And the joy that just filled my heart is indescribable. So I trust that this has inspired and challenged you that we should just be witnesses and go out there to share the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because you don't know, it may be just one word coming from you that will mean somebody has an eternity with the Lord. Thank you so much for tuning in and hearing that word today. All right, we're just going to run through a couple of things as we bring this service to a close. After this service at 8.30, we're going to be having a time of prayer just for half an hour. Do tune in and join us. You've got the number. Please call in and we'll just pray and just trust the Lord together as we've spent time as a family in prayer. We also pray regularly every Saturday between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning. So that's another time to join us. Okay, let's remember to honor the Lord with our tithes and with our offering. And today is another opportunity we have to do that. I'm just going to read a scripture for us as we prepare to do that today. If you have your Bibles with you, just turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 19 to verse 21. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is just an encouragement for us to just store up treasures in heaven, not just earthly treasures, because anything can happen to earthly treasures, but the treasures we store up as we sow, as we give of our, of our time, of our talent, and of our treasures to the Lord, nothing can take that away from us. So as you sow again today, just be encouraged with that word that you are storing up treasures in heaven as you sow. May the Lord continue to bless you and increase you and bless every seed sown today. Uh, yeah, we're doing it online, but do it with all your heart and do it in faith in Jesus' name. That's it. Let's share the grace together. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Now let's do our 2020 confession. I trust God for a remarkable year of fruitfulness. I will endeavor to hear God's voice clearly, obey his instructions carefully, and serve his agenda willingly every day. As a result, everything God promised will come to me speedily this year. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you until we see you next time.